So we're at about two minutes after. Uh, why don't we go ahead and officially get started with this. To, uh, recognize and appreciate your time being here. Uh, I'm Dave Reuter, Urban Conservationist with Franklin Soil and Water. Uh, and hey, welcome to Stormwater Awareness Week. I hope you're all participating in Stormwater Awareness Week. This is how we're kicking off Stormwater Awareness Week with our first of a series of MPDS trainings. Usually I'm getting out and meeting with a lot of you folks uh, in person to uh, give your staff some training on the MPDS permitting and programs, uh, which is all part of the, the MS4 uh, training requirements uh, by the permits. Uh, we have a new permit uh, term. Uh, the, the last one uh, actually uh, ended in September of uh, 2019. Uh, there's a draft permit out and we will hopefully go through some of that. And really what, what this training kind of represents is, is me going through the MCMs and the trainings that we've offered and kind of updating that. So this is, uh, my attempt to edit and update the training for you guys. Uh, I hope uh, you get a little bit out of this as well, uh, especially with the coming permit and kind of, uh, we're gonna kind of look at what the new draft permit language says relative to the old permit conditions uh, and a little bit deeper dive. I kind of like this, uh, the series aspect of this because I don't usually spend much time on individual MCMs, just kind of brush over them. So hopefully here we can, we can delve into them just a little bit further and, and do that deep dive into them. So as I'm sure everybody has been involved in, in Zoom meetings, uh, you know, so we're getting kind of used to this technology. We haven't delivered training uh, before. I've been in a lot of Zoom meetings, but now we're really looking at how we deliver this training uh, to our partners. So we have some poll questions in here. Uh, I would ask that you, that you participate in those poll questions. It's a way of us to uh, track your contact hours during these presentations. And uh, we're, we're trying to learn how to deliver this product to you in a way that that's also uh, counts for your, your training uh, uh, aspects. So bear with us on that. Uh, we're learning as well <laughs> on, on all of this. Uh, I hope it uh, works out uh, for us, but uh, please participate in that and we'll try to get uh, try to get started here. This is being recorded. Uh, you can use this hopefully as a resource down the road. Uh, you do need to register for the upcoming uh, series. Excuse me. The upcoming series, uh, do register for those if you want training and, and get your training certificate as well so we can track that participation. So I think we're gonna try our first poll question here. Uh, we'll go ahead and, Kylie's got that up. If you can uh, get the poll questions going. Looks like we have four people participating. So I know there's more of you out there. Keep trying to vote if you can, please. And again, like I say, this is this is part of that participation uh, for our our uh, tracking purposes, uh, and we do appreciate your your uh, use of this. Let's give it a few more seconds. Give everybody about a minute 30 to do that poll and we'll, we'll move on here. So about eight participants. 
I see eight of eight, hundred percent attendance now voting being questioned. So I think we will call it at this point. Okay, go ahead and end that. So I appreciate that. Uh, those are really, again, that's kind of for our back end uh, tracking purposes. Uh, I do appreciate you using that and and helping us uh, figure this all out and how we're going to do this. So, so let's get started a little bit here. I hope you all have possibly seen this and recognize this. How come we're doing this? Well, here's one of the reasons. This is the uh, infamous Cuyahoga River burning. Uh, Time Magazine had this, I believe, on their cover uh, in 1968. And, uh, it's kind of interesting. This was actually uh, the, the 1952 fire. And they used some of these dramatic pictures. This was one of the bigger fires, uh, caused quite a bit of damage. Uh, but it really uh, prompted the environmental movement to begin. And this is something that, you know, pushed the uh, development of the EPA in, in 72 and the passing of the Clean Water Act. Uh, and really, it's about water quality. Uh, this is something that, you know, I'm always surprised 1972, it was uh, Richard Nixon began the EPA. Uh, you know, we want to see that you know it's really a bipartisan issue when it comes to water quality. Water water quality is is not an argument you want to be on the side for polluting water. I mean, it really is a uh, a basic need of humans and a basic right for everyone to have good water quality. So this really began the environmental movement. Uh, the, for the MPDS uh, program. Uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about MPDS history, uh, where it comes from, the Clean Water Act in 72. Actually, that it was what we know as Clean Water Act is amendments to the National, uh, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1948. So we've been doing water pollution control for quite a while. It's just that these amendments come in and what we know as the Clean Water Act really started in 1972. And that began the MPDS program, which is the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. 87 amendments, they were, this is where we see the, the phased MPDS stormwater requirements come in. Uh, the 90 rules was the, the phase one rules for large municipal stormwater systems and large construction sites and for industries. And that really captured the publicly owned treatment works, uh, the, the industry standards and really helped clean up a lot of the, the major problems that were out there. Uh, 99 was the phase two rules. And that phase two was the small MS4s, those communities that are under 250,000 and don't perhaps have uh, you know, the, the, the publicly owned treatment works, uh, that kind of thing. But it does, this is where we're talking about what is a small MS4 and, and it's those assets that you manage within your community. And that's also where we had the small construction sites under five acres come into play was during that 99 period. Uh, again, and, and I have, if, if, you're, if you're interested in the federal uh, regulations, 40 CFR is where that's at. Uh, our Ohio code uh, 6111 uh, came around in 1992 uh, for the for the uh, water pollution control and water quality standards 3745. That came around in, in 1998. And what really concerns us here with Part of this training, part of this stormwater awareness week, uh, you know, outreach is that uh, small MS4 rules uh, that have been effective since 2004.
So let's talk about the phase two. You know, what is the phase two uh, of MPDS? Phase one applies to, like I said, the, 200, the larger than 250,000 community. Uh, community. Uh, we have four phase one permits in Ohio, uh, Cincinnati, Dayton, Columbus, and Cleveland. Those are your, your big cities basically that have this phase one permit requirement to it. And they've been doing this, like I say, for quite a while. Uh, in fact, Columbus is just now updating their drainage manual from uh, quite a while ago, actually. I, I was kind of surprised at how old their drainage manual was because they'd been doing this for a while and, and had those rules in place. But there was a lot of updating they needed to comply with the current status of things. So the, the phase two communities, Communities that are less than 250,000, uh, that's, that's all your, your suburbs. Uh, our, our local uh, permit uh, is with the, the, the county is looking at the, the townships and uh, unincorporated Franklin County. So we have a, a broad brush county permit that, that we help manage. And the, if you're if you're curious about how that's determined, it's all from the census tracts. I've got uh, in the notes uh, the EPA website where you can look at the boundaries of these urbanized areas and how that's determined. Uh, what is the MS4? Uh, like I said, th this is being recorded. Uh, we'll have this resource out for you uh, later on uh, if you uh, want to look at some of these resources and and. Uh, go back and, and uh, check this out. So MS4, let's let's talk a little bit about what that is exactly. This, uh, you know, for our purposes in this uh, webinar for MCM 1 and 2, your MS4 boundary is really what's in that census tract. So we're talking about your community and that community outreach effort goes community-wide. So in that sense, this diagram may not represent what actually is your MS4. This is going to become more important when we look you know, further down the series at the IDDE aspect of the permit and the construction and post-construction aspects of the permit and, and even the good housekeeping uh, portion. We're really looking at that point, your asset management uh, viewpoint of what your MS4 is. If, you're, if your community has facilities that you own and operate, that's going to be part of your MS4. As far as public outreach and education goes, your MS4 boundary is really about that area that's the urbanized area and what's, what's mapped. So your outreach, you know, some of that requirement is reaching 50% of your, your population, basically. So that's where that, that larger MS4 uh, definition comes into place when we're looking at uh, public education and outreach. So I guess we need to talk a little bit about stormwater management program. This is really kind of the document that every community has on how, who, what, when, and where they're going to meet these uh, MPDS requirements. Uh, you know, what best management practices are going to be implemented? You know, when will it be implemented? Who's going to be implementing it? How and why? And that how and why is something that's that's often missed uh, in the stormwater plans is getting that rationale down. You know, what is your rationale for picking this, this BMP? How are we going to implement that? You know, is it, what's the regulatory uh, aspect? Do you have the authority to do that? So, this is what your stormwater management plan is laying out for you, is, is how you're going to accomplish these goals set by the federally mandated permit. So let's take a look at the MPDS permit a little bit. Basically, this is the, the MS4 permit. It's based on six minimum control measures. Like I said, public education and, and public involvement. That's the MCM 1 and 2 that we're we're talking about today. Uh, the series will continue with illicit discharge and elimination uh, next week. Uh, the following week, I'm going to look at uh, post-construction and, and construction 
site runoff controls, MCM uh, uh, four and five, and then we'll finish up uh, the following week after that. Uh, I believe that's, what do we got? Uh, November 12th is the Good Housekeeping and Pollution Prevention uh, MCM uh, that we'll take a look at too. And again, like I say, uh, a lot of this is just a little bit more deep diving into what the old permit conditions are and what the new permit conditions uh, are saying and, and how those might change what you're doing in your program. And something that's going to come up is, is what you're doing in your program, if that needs to change with the new permit conditions, uh, you've got about six months to get those implemented uh, based on the new permit. And we'll we'll take a look at that and go into that a little bit more uh, as we get further down here. So here's again another poll question. Uh, I'll have uh, Kylie get that up there. And, and please, uh, I'll give you about a minute and a half, two minutes here to uh, address the poll question, please. And I did go ahead and add some information in the chat box for those upcoming uh, webinars as well. So folks can register for those if they haven't already and need to. Great, thanks Brooke. Yep. So there again, thanks again. Looks like we've got uh, a good mix, about a third, third of uh, private individuals, businesses and, and government entities, so that's, Good to know. Thank you for your participation. So if you haven't seen the permit, here's the old permit. And I just wanted to point out here, effective date, 2014, expiration date, 2019. So this is the old permit. We have a new permit uh, that is out. If you have not seen the draft permit, uh, we'll delve into that a little bit more. Uh, and first, let's talk a bit about public participation involvement. So something that your stormwater plan is involving, the, you need to be involving the public in your, in your stormwater management plan. You know, how, are you, how do you plan to do that? What's the target audience? You know, the type of public involvement uh, that you're going to have, whether that's public hearings, uh, stream cleanups, volunteer monitoring, tree plantings, things of those nature that you do in your community uh, to, to reach those goals. And something that's in the permit is must have at least five public involvement activities. So usually, you know, communities will have, I've worked uh, with several communities that we've done uh, stream cleanups every year, you know, for the past 15 years. And it's it's been on a, an ongoing, you know, well received by the public, you know, good participation, something that goes on and on year after year. And, and something that, you know, we, we've worked to develop that outreach and that involvement. Uh, and and it, it's, it's been successful in, in that respect. So those are the kind of things that we're looking for. Those are the kind of things that the permit's looking for that you're participating, actively involving the public in your stormwater management plan. So here is the new draft version. This is the red line version that shows the changes that have occurred or are proposed uh, for the new permit. And if we look at this, uh, something that, that has become more apparent in the new permit is, is fine tuning of the performance standards. And within this, so performance standard for your public involvement participation program at a minimum shall include five public involvement activities or the current term. And that's what we've seen in the past. So something that's been added is those permit terms with a TMDL performance standard may be required to implement more. So that TMDL performance standard, you see in number two there, see appendix A, uh, if your MS4 discharges to a watershed with a USP, 
US EPA approved TMDL, then we're at a minimum, including two public involvement activities targeting each TMDL pollutant identified. So what does that mean exactly? Well, if we look here at appendix four, I pulled this out just because it's Franklin County and it deals with a lot of the townships that are within our permit. And you can see over on the right-hand column, TMDL pollutants, uh, you know, it, it's a mixed bag. We've got E. coli, some of them have two, uh, total phosphorus, total suspended solids and E. coli. For the most part, we're looking at, at three pollutants per uh, area there. Now they're also talking about two uh, involvement activities per pollutant. So, you know, just back of the napkin, two times three pollutants, there's, there's six uh, activities that we're looking at just to address the TMDL aspect of that. So we've made some comments regarding that and, and to the new permit. We're not sure if, how much of this is gonna carry through, but this is what's proposed so far. And if your stormwater management plan doesn't address those, you're gonna to need to either develop new activities that do address that, or in your rationale on your stormwater management plan, explain how what you're currently doing actually does address some of these TMDL requirements. Now, I'd be hard pressed uh, to explain how a stream cleanup's gonna address E. coli, uh, particularly when that's you know, usually associated with home sewage treatment systems, uh, you know, but, but that is the kind of thing that's gonna come up with the new permit and taking a look at what the program requirements are and how you're gonna address those within your program. So if you haven't taken a look at that, I would suggest you do uh, once the new permit comes out, uh, they are requiring uh, that everything be updated within six months. That was another comment that we made. Uh, that may be a pretty short time frame uh, to, to change some things around, uh, particularly uh, resolution or uh, regulations. If there's a need to change any of that, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, so we'll see what comes out. But this is what the draft permit is saying so far, and this is what we're seeing. Hey, Dave. Um, yeah. Just noticed uh, Beth has had a question there, and you might have kind of answered it with that, okay. but just asking about five whether there's five public involvement activities by each jurisdiction required then. That is a uh, good question. Uh, I think uh, there are EPA's expectations is there, that is the expectation. Uh, I have a question regarding whether or not when we are have when we have co-permittees like with our county permit and those activities are uh, being based countywide through our permit activities uh, if if that was the, that was the whole point of being a co-permittee on a lot of these permits is being able to participate in some of that uh, outreach material so I think we can make a strong case, uh, particularly with the co-permittees, uh, that a lot of these activities are being covered. Uh, again, I, uh, that's my opinion on it. Uh, and, and we'll see what EPA thinks, but that, that's something that, that we are gonna be looking at uh, for sure. And that's one of the reasons why we've kind of gone to, you know, this, the Stormwater Awareness Week and the outreach. You know, this is a time of year where we can do a holistic outreach and really have a broad uh, program and, 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 you know, a defined uh, message that we can send out that everybody can participate in. and We can get that, that total outreach uh, coverage for everybody on their permit. So, yeah, that's, that's a good question, Beth. And, and like I say, I don't have the answer. Uh, we will be uh, talking a bit uh, with EPA. EPA right now has been uh, very cooperative and, and very, they're in a good partnership way right now uh, 
we've worked well with them uh, and and they're they're very uh, good at, at that like I say that partnership and, and uh, just talking to them about things and getting things worked out in a in a reasonable way so we'll we'll definitely continue with that uh, any other uh, questions in the chat that have come up okay So public education and outreach. We do a lot of this uh, within uh, soil and water uh, for communities. Uh, you know, part of this is really that K through 12 school outreach. We have uh, a couple of the best educators, uh, probably of all the districts here. Linda's been doing this for years and years, uh, and we have a, a great program for that. So if you ever need those kind of uh, abilities check your districts your your soil and water districts have outreach materials available uh, and they usually uh, go with the uh, the curriculums uh, i know ours ours meets a lot of the curriculums uh, for the k through 12 uh, so it's a, it's something that you can it's a resource no matter where across the state uh, that you can use uh, for your educational uh, outreach aspects. Uh, part of that is is reaching 50% of the population. You know, it's not all school kids, so you've got to reach 50% of your uh, population. And five different themes, and having those five different themes is important. And this again comes up in the permit language. So in the past, we've really looked at, at, um, at having five themes. Well, now with those TMDL performance standards in there, you may have more than five themes to address those TMDL standards. And don't forget, one of those one of those standards is to address uh, the development community as well. Uh, so we have had uh, a lot of program developments just because of trying to meet these various needs. Uh, one of them that I know in the past has been very recently in the past was, was small businesses and reaching out to those as far as like uh, fats, oils, and greases. That's been a big, big one. And yet that's something that we don't see come up in the TMDL performance standards. So I'm not even sure how we apply some of those existing programs uh, to some of these performance standards. We may have to add additional activities in there to meet some of these performance standards. So you uh, see some of the red. Sorry, yeah. just wrote, that's a good segue actually. Uh, Kevin just asked a question or just um, about that it's interesting that well-developed cities as such as up Arlington or Worthington have a TSS pollutant listed in that TMDL appendix. Um, you know, thinking that TSS pollutant would be more, um, would stem more from ongoing development projects. Where and I think that's, yeah, I think that's where a lot of that TSS uh, was intended to be coming from. Now, another aspect of that though, is also uh, bank erosion that we're seeing a lot of just because of the urban stream syndrome. Uh, so, so that development aspect, we need to be looking at meeting the, the stormwater discharge rates uh, so that we're not getting the uh, you know the, the the discharges to our channels that are that are not channel protective and are eroding those banks, so it almost takes a little more digging into the the TMDLs on what is actually uh, contributing to that factor. You know this table is just listing TSS. Okay. So our program, you know, we, we have developer outreach and we, we do construction site controls and make sure they're meet, meeting the stormwater uh, discharge rates. You know, that would be the rationale in your program on, on that outreach and how you're, how you're meeting that. So I, I hate to say there's a lot of wordsmithing that needs to happen, but I do think you need to look at what your rationale is, where those programs uh, fit some of these TMDL requirements. We've looked at TSS for a long time as, as really an analog to uh, nutrients. So, you know, if you're controlling sediment uh, and erosion, you're controlling that 
nutrient problem. So there again, you know, if, if it takes added language to your rationale to really point out that, hey, this is intended for total phosphorus, you know, by limiting our sediment loading, you know, and looking, our, our big problem is, is urban erosion. And that's where our TSS is coming from. So it's important for us to manage those discharges to our creeks. You know, that kind of language is something that I think is gonna be important to put in your rationale statements, put in your stormwater program, and make sure that that is apparent while you're, you're stressing those BMPs. So something to look forward to <laughs> in the future, uh, in, the, in the near term too. Like I say, uh, you're gonna have six months to respond uh, to these changes and address those in your stormwater plan. So let me just talk a little bit. Let's see, did I skip over one? Yeah, I did. So this was a response that, that we've had to developer outreach. Uh, this is a, actually a 30 by 40 poster uh, that we have printed up. Uh, we can have it printed on vinyl, it can be hung in the, the work trailer on a, on a site and, and be uh, educational for, for how stormwater controls work on a site. You know, this is something that, that we've, we've seen a problem with the boots on the ground, not understanding what controls are. You know, if you're gonna have a, a dandy bag on the site that, that's controlling the, the stormwater discharge, you don't want the guy walking over and saying, well, here's, here's why we've got a puddle here. It's this bags on this inlet. And he, he pries it up with a two by four to get it to drain. That happens all the time. You know, so, so having that education, why that's there, gets that boots on the ground. And this is something that, that we have developed just in response to that. We have another one uh, for individual uh, lot uh, development. Uh, but it's really about that boots on the ground and getting that developer outreach. And it's another mechanism. It, you know, this, in the past, we've re relied on that developer outreach to be done through, you know, maybe pre-con meetings where you're, you're reviewing their plans and making comments on their SWIP. Uh, this is another aspect of that uh, and another mechanism to use where you're actually uh, putting this out on site getting those boots on the ground uh, to understand uh, what the controls are. Uh, and again, like I say, this resource is available uh, to anybody that would like to use it. Uh, and, and we'd be more than happy to share this uh, with anybody that wants to use it. Yep, Dave, I just add to that, that we do have a trifold handout as well that, with that information now. So, and some of you, I've been trying to get around the county and drop off some copies of that, but if you need some, or if I haven't gotten to you yet, just let me know or if you have a site that you think would be interested or that you would like them to display a poster on, uh, same thing, let us know and we can, we can get that to you. So very quickly, you know, let's, let's talk about some of the outreach uh, potential here. You know, especially in this day and age, I think this is something that, you know, this is not going away. This is going to be something that, that is more and more used. Uh, and, and social media is something that we are really starting to embrace. Uh, I don't think it will go away once, once the pandemic is over. Uh, it, it's a useful tool and I encourage everybody to use it. This is, this is a, from New Albany's Facebook page. You know, this was something for uh, Stormwater Awareness Week in their observance. Uh, just a real quick, quick Facebook, you know, what can you do uh, to join in uh, Stormwater Week? Some quick bulleted items there that, that kind of, you know, how can you participate? This is, this is what you can do in that. This, I, I, we're, we're just going to see more and more of this. Uh, I think it's, it's very important that we embrace it and really start using it. This I hope everybody's seeing that run. We started a digital campaign uh, this week. This is being displayed at the, the digital kiosks uh, at the bus stops. 
uh, with Orange Barrel, Orange, Orange Barrel Media. Uh, oops, let me go back to that. I wanted to do something here as far as be aware. I'm a big fan of QR codes right here. Uh, you know, it's something uh, that that makes the URL, uh, the 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 access to the internet very simple. Uh, we're seeing a lot more use of QR codes. And it's kind of funny the QR codes had a brief moment here earlier uh, when it first kind of came around, but it kind of died out. Uh, if you look at some of the Asian and, and European countries, QR codes are are really being used extensively. And uh, even Apple has gone to including that in their phone as, you know, it used to be you added it from the app store uh, to read QR codes. Now all the Apple phones just come with it. So you hold your, your phone up to it with your camera and it takes you directly, uh, you can link directly to that that website. So for a, for a quick visual reference, it's something really handy uh, to have. And, and again, the phone, you know, phones are pervasive now. Everybody has a cell phone. Uh, even, you know, this is why if you looked at that construction poster, there's a QR code on that construction poster. Uh, that way the boots on the ground, you know, a construction worker could pull out their phone they can access our website and then look at that specific uh, practice in more detail or even get the, the rainwater and land development spec on it to make sure that it's, it's, in, it's in the specification. So that's really something that, that we're gonna see just a lot more of. I've got up here, this is actually my Dublin Go app. Uh, it's their uh, way of, of maintaining their service requests. But this is something, you know, that, that we're really looking at crowdsourcing information at this point. Uh, this is a, a valuable tool, and especially for the tracking of things like the MCM uh, uh, outreach programs. You know, this is a way that we can see participation by the community. You know, they can report uh, spills or report incidents of, of uh, dumping or things of that nature or have service requests for, for flooding or, or uh, you know, blocked catch basin, all this kind of thing. We're really now at that crowdsourcing aspect. And, and if you don't have these abilities, you know, have a website, look at those QR codes, use that kind of thing, and you can really help to, to track and, and maintain that kind of information. I think we're gonna see a, a big use of this and I think it's a, a really handy tool. Something, you know, we're, we're looking at, at crowdsourcing data, water quality data. Uh, I know EPA is looking at that as well. Uh, right now, the only uh, drawback is the regulatory aspect where, you know, credible data has to be level three and how to figure out how to get crowdsourced information at that kind of level, uh, you know, that will be, something down the road uh, will and definitely something that's that's going to be coming but looking at that crowdsourcing uh, I think that's it's a great thing and it's something that, that we definitely are, are going to see in the future so very quickly these are just some of the programs that we have in-house and, and really it's it's our attempts at at addressing a lot of these outreach uh, requirements. Uh, pup program, pick up poop, pick up after your pet. You know, that's something that uh, neighborhoods that can join into. And, and, you know, I think we're gonna have to go back through all of these and really look at these and, and how they address that. Perhaps that one's, you know, we're, we can address phosphorus loading with, with picking up your poop. Grass, you know, getting grassy, community backyards, those are programs where we're looking at perhaps dumping along streams and, and that uh, biological loading of our streams. This is where you're getting a lot of that, that phosphorus loading, you know, low oxygen de you know, demand because of those 
uh, leaves and, and grass clippings, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, planting native plants. Again, I think something important to us there is getting that tree canopy back established, using plants that are going to survive in our conditions, you know, not using uh, invasive plants. And of course, you know, reporting pollution, that's something that our IDDE program uh, is involved with. Uh, anytime you see something, uh, and that's where we can really look at that, that crowdsourcing data and that kind of thing. Uh, the one at the bottom there, you, you can't see it too well there. Let's see if I can. Water Quality Partnership. Uh, you know, this is kind of uh, giving back the, the kudos to, to businesses and, and uh, individuals that, that want to try to be a, a steward of our water quality. And, and like I say, you know, water quality is something you know, this is this is, should be a basic human right. We're all working for better water quality. Uh, and this is what all these programs are about. So I see, I think I'm at my last poll question here. And it looks like we're running right on time. So get everybody's participation in this last poll question. Looks like we got them rolling in. I do appreciate your participation. Like I say, this will help us uh, with our delivery down the road on some of this training. So I can also please. just make a little plug there. You know, a lot of these programs were developed based on specific issues within communities or that they saw a need for outreach to a certain subsect. So um, if there's something in your community that you're having issues with or, you know, let us know. We can, if we don't have something already existing, we can definitely work on putting together um, information that'll help with that. Um, one example is just with OBETS, we're working with them to get education out to their warehouses. They have a lot of warehouses, so spill kit information and also um, auto care outreach over there. So just uh, keep that in mind. So I think we'll close the polling at this point. Brooke, were there any uh, questions left unanswered? I do not see any other ones in there right now. Okay, great. Uh, we are at, looks like about 55 minutes, so right on time. Uh, I will say, uh, be sure to check out uh, the next webinars, uh, they are coming up. We'll have these weekly for the next four weeks or so. Uh, feel free to register those. Feel free to share that uh, with anybody else, any staff that, that you think uh, might benefit from this training. And it will be uh, pretty much the same next time, except we'll look at MCM3. Uh, which is the illicit discharge detection elimination. Perhaps I can get John Bailey, our guru himself, <laughs> to participate. Uh, I will certainly ask to see if he can help out uh, next time. But if you have that interest, uh, please sign up for those. And, and we'll try to, we'll cover some more uh, of the permit aspects and what they mean to that specific MCM and also just kind of the general overview of, of what uh, the MPDS requirements are. So once again, thanks. Uh, thank you for participating. And with that, I will end this in the recording. Thank you. <laughs>